Welcome to Boomer TV. I'm Julie Patterson. And I'm Paul Poteet. Mm -hmm. Red, green, happy holidays. We're, we're excited about the holidays and there are a lot of reasons for that. We've got a couple of different holiday themes going this episode I think you'll like. This one involves lots of lights. We're going to take you to the zoo if you've not been out there. A lot of great animals, clearly, but uh, Christmas at the zoo is a sight to behold. Christmas is a time for giving and who knows more about that than gleaners. Oh, the food bank. Yeah, the food bank is open. A lot of food drives happen around this time of year, and we hope that you generously will support that. But we'll learn about gleaners today. And we're going to learn about the woman who paints these pictures. Uh, Reggie her, Miller, Kurt Vonnegut. Yeah, on the buildings downtown near Mass Avenue. And her name is Pamela Bliss. Uh, you'll get to meet her on the episode this morning. And we're also going to make a delicious salad. Mmm, Christmassy too. I mean, literally, <laughs> it's Christmassy. Well, the Christmas salad, it's got like fruit and nuts, and Paul's got to eat, so we're going to make that happen <laughs> and for it him. It's like a little tree on top of it. Yeah, oh, you're going to love it. Yeah, Heather's going to show us that coming up in just yeah. a little bit too. It's all working its way towards you on Boomer TV this morning. Unwrap it slowly. <laughs> Don't peek. TV is made possible with support from Westport Homes, dedicated to building homes for every chapter of life, with plans and details that match customers' specific needs and style. Additional funding is provided by Altman, Poindexter, and Wyatt attorneys, serving clients throughout central Indiana with wills, trusts, and estates, with over 70 years of combined experience. Unique Home Solutions, serving more than 30,000 homeowners since 1983 providing home remodeling services from minor updates to complete renovations with a mission to improve appearance and efficiency. Lights, camera, action. Not just on our show. Yeah, sounds like Boomer TV. Yeah, I mean, at the zoo, too, there's lights. Oh, my lights. goodness. I love how they do different themes for different mm -hmm. seasons, and the holiday one at the zoo is one of the best for sure. So we've got a couple of uh, great uh, angles for you right now. You ready? Let's take a drive. And some animals, too. <laughs> well, yeah, you got that. Good. It's a zoo. Let's do it. Santa's study. We like, are. It's very, I mean, it's official. Guy, he could be here any minute. I know. I'm here with Meg Magsiman from the Indianapolis Zoo. Hello. I am so excited I to be know. here. I'm glad the to have you. The Indianapolis Zoo, I mean, what a mm -hmm. treasure. How lucky we are to have this in our city. And you just told me something really special about this Christmas display that I yes. did not know. So here at the zoo, we've been celebrating Christmas at the zoo, presented by Donato's and Teachers Credit Union for 50 years. So to have that kind of recognition, how often do you hear of places celebrating such a milestone? So we are incredibly proud. Um, so much of this work is even done internally by our teams. It's certainly a labor of love to put it together every year. 50 years and every year yes. it is a little different, but you were saying that the yep. Indianapolis Zoo was actually one of the first, the first? We are the very first zoo in all of the U.S. to do a Christmas lighting event. So how special to have a time we can come out and see the animals that are maybe a little bit more cold weather mm -hmm. acclimated. Yeah. <laughs> they like the nightlife a little bit more. We have several species where that's the case and it's a fun time to be able to come out and enjoy those animals instead. And you walk through those doors yeah. and you're immediately in the spirit with the yes. music and the lights. I Tell know. me what's new this year. If families yep. have been coming, they yes. make this a tradition. Very much. 
so. You're absolutely right. So what's nice is we did this brand new space where we have Santa, Mrs. Claus, the reindeer, and a few other fun little bonus elements that we put all together under Santa's Village. So you come in here and it's a very whimsical, relaxing place that you really want to be in and spend time in. So you can spend time in the gazebo, going through the tunnel of lights, visiting with the big guy himself. Yeah. So it's a great time to come out and have a little bit of everything that kind of brings that Christmas magic together. But then we add in lights inside of lights throughout the rest of the zoo on top of the animals too. And it's just a really special time to come out, something for everyone, and have a really nice visit with your family. I love that. Now you were saying mm -hmm. that you will still see some animals out. What are yes. some of the animals that maybe like the cold weather that we'll be able to see? Absolutely. The tigers love this. The brown bears are native to Alaska. They think this is great too, <laughs> no yeah. matter what those days bring. Uh, walrus, sea lion, a number of those animals that may not be as active in the summer months, you find being really engaging this time of year. It's also nice how we have so many indoor buildings that are spread out throughout ground. So you can run into oceans and still pet a shark and see some of those new exhibits and then go a little bit further and go into a dolphin presentation and go a little bit further and go warm up inside of deserts or go to the International Orangutan Center. And then we have two campfires too. So plenty of ways to stay warm, feel like you're having a really cool zoo visit that feels nothing like any other time of the year. Yeah, I love it because I mean, I bring my daughter to the zoo all summer long Good. but this is yep. a must-have because it, it really yeah. feels so different this time of year it does as soon as that um, darkness comes in and those lights start to pop on and then you're just immersed in the lights it's completely different and if you're worried about being cold you were saying there's no. all kinds of treats and nice warm yes. drinks to get a I little know. warm up this is one of my favorites so we've been doing for a number of years a cup of cheer and it's a reusable thermos cup that's very pretty and decorated and you can go to any one of our food service places and get a free refill for it so you can get hot chocolate in another 30 minutes you can get coffee in another 30 minutes you can get hot cider so it's kind of nice i think even fun or easy to do for a date night if you're coming yeah. out and want to kind of have a you know, nice fun visit. That's kind of a fun little bonus to it. It is great. Okay, so I gotta. I mean, I gotta drink hot cider, yes. hot chocolate, <laughs> hot coffee. So Meg, thank you so much for I having know. us, giving it's us the great. the whole lowdown, guys. I gotta go because I have a long list of hot drinks and treats, and I guess I should probably see some animals while we're here too. And don't forget the mistletoe. And the mistletoe. So yes, we, this is like an adventure. It is. So we have ten hidden mistletoes on grounds, and you have to go around and try to find them. So what's neat is if you find at least five of them, you can enter to win an animal art adventure. And we'll draw two names at the end of the month. We get to go behind the scenes, see the animals, and have that experience. Pick out your own paint color and have the animals do a beautiful custom work of yeah. art for you. So oh, I love those. it's a fun time during the event to try to find them. Um, together with your group or even if you want to compete and not share when you find places with yeah. them and then have that as a bonus it's pretty special okay too. so now I've got to get a hot drink and it looks like I've got a competition to <laughs> win so thank you so much You're for having welcome. us we really appreciate it you guys this is a must see this holiday season uh, we're gonna be able to go check it all out now so for now I'm Amanda Clark with Boomer TV so when you drive down Michigan uh -huh. uh, Street in downtown Indianapolis you'll notice a brand new mural of Reggie Miller. <laughs> Reggie. You can't say his name without turning into a red porter. I He's know. amazing. Old Number school. 31. Yeah. Pacers. Reggie Miller. Um, I've had so many friends I've seen on Facebook post their pictures in front of the mirror. Oh yeah. It's cool. It's brand new uh, and it's painted by the same lady who did the Kurt Vonnegut painting on a building down on Mass Avenue. Her name is Pamela Bliss. Would you like to meet her? Let's find out more Let's about do. Pamela Bliss. A special thanks to the Arts Council of Indianapolis for hosting us today and a special thank you to Pamela Bliss for joining us. I know you haven't been feeling well, a little under the weather. We really appreciate you coming down and spending some time with us to share your story. Thank you for having me. And for people who aren't familiar with you, tell us what you do. I paint outdoor murals, larger than life, um, very extremely large murals. And we're talking like sides of buildings, right? Sides I mean, buildings. when you say larger than life, <clears throat> I mean, you stand next to it, you're like this big. Right. My tallest one today is 60 feet tall, and I just finished that one of Reggie Miller. And where is that one located? That one's located on the corner of Michigan Street and Delaware in downtown Indianapolis. So 60 feet tall, that's six stories? Correct. How yeah. long does it take you to paint something like that? Well, it depends on um, the amount of detail and um, it depends on the number of subjects that's in a mural. 
the more subjects that I have to make likeness, then the longer it takes me. But that one took me a little over a month because you have to deal with weather sometimes. Mm -hmm. What was Reggie Miller's reaction to you painting him on the side of a building? I cannot believe I am on the side of this building. Thank you, Pamela Bliss. It was your vision and your magical hands that made all this come about. And Pam, I just got one more big thank you. These ears, I appreciate you making them true to size. So thank you. God bless you guys, and I cannot wait to see this in person. I'll see everyone soon. What's the process of putting together a mural? Well, you don't just walk up to a mural and start painting it. Oh, okay. Um, you don't walk up to a wall and start painting it. Um, there's a, uh, especially in places like downtown Indianapolis, you have to go through a lot of layers like uh, um, approvals and that kind of thing. Um, once, you, once you make your design and your decision on the theme, the building owner or the artist, you know, whichever um, that comes to be. Then, uh, for instance, on the Reggie Miller mural, we had to um, get several extra approvals because we had to go to get permission from the Pacers permission from the NBA, uh, Reggie himself, uh, besides a few different layers within the city to get approvals. So you have all these approvals, you're ready to paint. Right. How do you even envision and to know what you're painting where? I mean, that's a <coughs> huge canvas. Right. Um, I um, come up with a design. Uh, a lot of times because I do, people want me to depict, uh, it's memorializing usually. Uh, someone so there's photographs that I can can uh, work off of and so um, I'll take that photograph or I'll put it in a design and make sure that it fits on the wall and then um, <clears throat> once I get that done then I when I get to the wall I have to do a lot of measuring um, there are some artists who use projection but I it just seems more, more artful to me anyway if I'm actually doing the sketching so how did you even get into drawing murals Pro art professor called me and when I was at the tail end of my um, bachelor's degree in Richmond Indiana someone was looking for a mural to be painted about the history of jazz in Richmond Indiana my art professor re recommended me because I have uh, an aptitude for portraiture and so I they asked me to paint the mural and I said yes and why was jazz so important to Richmond that's the first place of recorded jazz ever. And what is the impact to the community to have that public art there, to see that figure from the community? What, is, what does it do for us? It becomes a f part of the fabric of the community. And so many people, I didn't realize that um, the, the first mural I did, for example, um, people grow to love that because it becomes their identity, a part of their identity every day, the identity, identity of the community. And so they start appreciating more. And I, I have found that when I have painted a mural in a, in a town, uh, they want more. And so people start appreciating, they take more pride, mm -hmm. and they start doing projects themselves, and it just enhances a community. Well, and these murals don't, you know, they don't stay exactly the way they are the day that you're done painting them, right? Over time, you know, just right. the weather, the different elements. And you were recently involved in a project for restoring a big mural, were you not? That was the Jazz Musicians of Indiana Avenue. And I, that was one of the uh, Indianapolis Art Council. Um, they had um, hosted a um, the Super Bowl mural program. And um, there was 46 murals that were put up. And I they gave me two murals. And one of them was the Kurt Vonnegut on Mass Ave. Mm -hmm. That one's 38 feet tall. The other one was the Jazz Musicians. and. Um, so uh, we, we've, I've had to touch up both of them. Uh, the one on uh, Indiana Avenue, well, it's on Capitol in Vermont. You can view it from Indiana Avenue. Mm -hmm. But those jazz musicians, they all performed on Indiana Avenue. Wow, I wasn't aware of that. Right, so it's very, it depicts history. Most of my murals depicts history. And I'm guessing you're not afraid of heights? You know, I am. Are you? <laughs> yeah, I, I have sometimes have little panic attacks if I walk up to a banister and too quickly and when there's a drop off mm -hmm. I'll have a but um, when I'm up in a boom lift I'm the first day or two I'm a little shaky and I get butterflies in my stomach and then um, <clears throat> I just have to when I start painting I zone out and I just kind of forget which helps you know but you know I have to when I'm first up there I have to remember 
that um, I'm not dying <laughs> and yeah. just to keep painting. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. It has been so great getting to know you. Thank you. And hopefully you've inspired someone watching today who maybe would like to follow in your footsteps. I hope so. <laughs> From the Arts Council of Indianapolis with Pamela Bliss, I'm Mel McMahon for Boomer TV. So does Mrs. Poteet get excited about holiday recipes? Does she like to cook she new loves, fun things? Oh, unfortunately for me, she loves to cook. Well, yeah. I guess fortunately, because you know, I gotta eat. You get to enjoy it, and yeah, you gotta yeah. eat because you're Paul Poteet. Yeah, right. How about a fun Christmas salad oh. with lots of fruit, some nuts? That is kind of a festive food. It's a great one for the holiday season, and we're going to show you how to make it. Heather, tell us. Well, today I'm going to make something called a Christmas tree salad. I love this festive salad. It's perfect for the holidays. I actually made this for my family a couple weeks ago, and I didn't anticipate this being a Christmas tree salad, but when I started putting it together, it resembled a Christmas tree, and you'll see why. So I start with a bunch of Swiss chard. I like to get organic Swiss chard, because um, this is gonna be the base of your tree. Right, so we need something that's going to withstand all the ingredients and it's going to form a big peak like a tree, you'll see. So when you're shopping for it, make sure you get fresh, bouncy, charred like that, wash and pat it dry, and then you're just going to slice it into ribbons. Um, this is really healthy. So this Swiss chard is full of tons of vitamins and minerals. I'm also going to add pomegranate seeds. So we're going to add these into it. So then we're also going to add red grape globes. I just sliced these in half. I'm going to add those. I think of these as kind of the bulb of the tree, right? I like to use a small Honeycrisp apple. I am just have that chopped up. So that goes in there. And we're going to use a few mandarin orange segments. See how pretty these are? So you can think of these as the ornaments to your tree. Again, this is rich in vitamin C. I'm also gonna add pecans to this salad. And this is the only fat we're putting in this salad. So I didn't even toast these, they're just raw pecans, and I've chopped them. Sprinkle those over your salad. We're gonna go ahead and make the dressing. We're doing a tablespoon of maple syrup, grade B if you can find that, two tablespoons of apple cider vinegar, which is already in here. I'm going to do an eighth of a teaspoon of coriander, an eighth of a teaspoon of turmeric, which gives it that nice vibrant color, and just some salt and pepper to taste. It's not a whole lot of dressing as you can see. I'm just going to whisk that around. And then I'm just going to mix it all up. And what we're going to do is kind of start building up. So it's tall and it's in the center of the table. And as you can see, this is starting to take the shape of a Christmas tree. Isn't this pretty? So you can see all the red and the green and the orange. Every Christmas tree needs a star on the top. So I found a handy dandy star cookie cutter and I just got some multi-grain toast and I went ahead and just shaped a little star, toasted it, and you can kind of set that right on the top. How cute is that? So hopefully this will be a nice addition to your holiday table this season. For Boomer TV, I'm Heather McWilliams. Bon appetit. Julie, there's nothing like uh, the assistance from Hoosiers helping Hoosiers and boy, as long as I can remember, Gleaners has always been around, it seems yeah. like, yeah. You know, we're fortunate, you know, we have food on our table every day. It's not mm -hmm. the same for everybody in our city. So it's a good thing that a Gleaners is around to help those in need. Tell me a little bit about what you do on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis and possibly what your uh, annual vision or goal that you guys work towards. So Gleaners actually runs four parallel operations. The traditional food bank is the one most people know, where we act as the wholesale distributor and in some cases direct provider of food to the food insecure across about a third of the population of Indiana in 21 counties. 
but we also are a produce distribution center operator for 39 food banks across seven Midwest states. We also act as a natural disaster response site for Feeding America, one of about a dozen food banks around the country that when a hurricane hits in Texas or Florida or some such, we, we consolidate the response, food and non-food, uh, and then dispatch that from here. And we also are a storage site for FEMA as part of that role. And then our fourth role is we're contract uh, reclamation center for Kroger stores in Indiana and Illinois. So four operations in parallel, the best known being the food bank role. Most likely we may have some uh, boomer viewers out there that have unique skills that aren't necessarily about walking food into gleaners. And uh, they are on a more higher level like an accountant or something like that that uh, you would, I'm sure, welcome with open arms to come and serve. Absolutely. And increasingly we're we're looking at volunteer opportunities off-site. You know, historically, for example, as we had mobile pantry vehicles that would go out and serve in rural counties or places where we don't have enough brick and mortar pantries, it would be up to that host organization or maybe only partially up to gleaners to find enough volunteers to distribute at that church parking lot at the rural edge of a county somewhere. So we call this the chute. Okay. Four lanes wide, one way, uh, one way east to west. Those refrigerated box trucks are really the backbone of the fleet. Okay. They'll do mixed routes. Where outbound, they may deliver food to a food pantry. They may deliver supplies to a food drive location. On the way back, they pick up food drive proceeds. They pick up donated food at retail stores. They may make a run to a. a um, food plant or distribution center, it's sort of a mix. Clients will come in this way. Okay. There are two employees in this pantry, all the rest are volunteers. I see. So you'll have as few as half a dozen, as many as 20 volunteers that'll be at each station. So they'll start here with produce, then go on to meat. There's uh, usually bread. And then if we have dairy or specialty items, they're down there at the end and then the shelf stable is here. How do you supply your inventory? Is that purchased That's or right. donated? It's about uh, three quarters donated and about one fourth purchased. Okay. So, and if you think about the two opportunities, say it's a dollar retail can, by the time you had multiple transportation stops, all the staffing equivalent and so on, it could have four to five dollars of cost sure. when it's actually handed to the person, but it's one dollar value. So the, give us a dollar in cash right. and we can go out and shop at General Mills or Kraft or Nabisco or companies that give us deep discounts yes. and it's leaving our building still less than retail cost. So it's, it's dramatic. We can take a dollar in cash yes. and deliver nine dollars in value to somebody who's hungry or you can take a one dollar can and it's four or five times the cost by the time it's delivered. Yeah. I never thought of that. So we are pushing, this. obviously, Cash fund donations, drives, yes. not food drives. Right. So if you really want to help and you want to make your money go further, yes. let's just write a check instead of going through the trouble of yep. transferring food. So, right. boy, that's something I never thought of. Yep. And, uh, a real useful tip. Actually, somewhat unusual uh, that a food bank would have its own pantry but also even more unusual, and this is a test where our friends at St. Vincent have put that's in a wonderful. clinic. Oh, that's great. So when people who can't afford to buy food come in here, they're typically skipping medical care or other things as well. Sure. They can get free care through St. Vincent. The setup on the other side of that wall is, wow. think of it like uh, one of the retail stores of CVS or Walgreens. Sure. We have a couple exam rooms and a lab mm -hmm. and so on. I yeah. just think it's great that you're healing people uh, while you're feeding them. So every Friday okay. at 248 schools across our 21 counties, 9,900 back sacks are distributed to kids so they can eat over the weekend between school lunch Friday and school breakfast Monday. So you'll see there's a mix of items. Hi guys. It's, it's, got, a, it's got a mix of protein and, and so on in there. It's Again, it's not meant to be full meals all weekend, but a supplement. Yes. For some kids that is all they eat. 
the unfortunate reality is we're having to do this and give this to these kids at school because there's no adult involved in feeding that kid over the weekend. John, I want to thank you for sharing all the wonderful things Gleaners does here in central Indiana. This is Glenn Bill with Boomer TV. Hope you enjoyed today's show. And you know, our next couple of episodes are going to be fun because we get to look back. Oh, we're going to kind of like best of our, yeah. our favorites, I'd like to call them. We're going to bring to you the next couple of episodes right here on WFYI. Stories you may have missed the first time around. Yeah, there you go. Don't well, miss them the second time around. Yeah, so. we'll wrap them up. We'll give them to you for a holiday <laughs> gift. Next That's few up. weeks right here. So make sure you don't miss an episode of Boomer TV. We'll see you next week. For more All Things Boomer, just visit our website. That's IndieBoomer.com. Indie Boomer connects TV, magazine, and radio. It contains useful information for baby boomers all over the Indianapolis metropolitan area. And you can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Pick up Indie Boomer magazine at most Kroger stores and libraries. Look for us all over Indie. Listen to Boomer Radio every Saturday afternoon at 4.30 p.m. on Freedom 95 with a rebroadcast Sundays at 7.30. Indie Boomer, for the next chapter of your life. Boomer TV is made possible with support from Westport Homes, dedicated to building homes for every chapter of life, with plans and details that match customers' specific needs and style. Additional funding is provided by Altman, Poindexter, and Wyatt attorneys serving clients throughout central Indiana with wills, trusts, and estates with over 70 years of combined experience. Unique Home Solutions, serving more than 30,000 homeowners since 1983. Providing home remodeling services from minor updates to complete renovations with a mission to improve appearance and efficiency.